I invite you in your scripture to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Give you a bit of an introduction of myself so you understand where I'm coming from and where God has placed me. Uh, my father is Turkish. My mother is Swedish. My wife's from the Czech Republic. And our kids will need a psychologist one day. We, uh, my, my father and mother immigrated here to the United States in 1969. I was born in 1970. Both my brothers were born overseas. I was born here. I do like to remind them of that because you know what that means. I can be president. They can't. <laughs> and uh, uh, they can be governor of California if they want, but they can't be president. Uh, we come from an immigrant family. My wife just became a citizen uh, last December as uh, she raised her right hand and allegiance and so forth. Uh, when we came here, the point of my father and mother coming here, my mother, uh, Muslims would say reverted, not converted, to Islam. And we came on over to the United States, not merely because of the economic uh, riches that were here, but my father was a Muslim leader. And he planted and helped pioneer a mosque right in central Ohio where we settled. Uh, but it was because of an obnoxious youth who shared Jesus with me that my life is completely different. Uh, he wasn't merely persistent. He wasn't merely pushy. He was a bit obnoxious, and I enjoyed that about him. Uh, he had no idea about Islam, none. Knew Jesus very well, very loving, but he had no clue about Islam. I knew that. I knew that when he invited me to Denny's to eat ham, that he had no clue who we were. He invited me to every little event a Southern Baptist church had up in Columbus, Ohio. He invited me to a thing called a lock-in. Now, if you grew up in church, you know what a lock-in is. I didn't know what a lock-in is. It is in the Bible. Look under the word hell. <laughs> you will find a lock-in. And it was, for the first time in my life, I went to a revival meeting, didn't know what that was, at a Baptist church, didn't know what that was, where I finally found out who Jesus truly is. He wasn't merely a prophet, but he's prophet, priest, and king, the son of God who came to save my soul and redeem me and set me free, and everything's changed. And all of a sudden, years later now, I end up in Georgia. I didn't plan on ending up in Georgia. I didn't plan on doing what I'm doing, but God's ways are so much greater than our ways, and he gives us so much more than we deserve. There are a thousand people who are far more deserving to be president of a college than me. I did graduate in the top 10% of the bottom half of my class, but that's probably the large accolade I have. I love it, though. If you ever get pessimistic about this generation, just drive about 55 minutes up the road north on 400. And you'll run into Truett McConnell College, soon to be university, a school that was the hidden secret of the mountains, had just a few hundred students. Now we're up to about 1,600. But the numbers are not what should get you. It's coming to a Thursday morning chapel and seeing seven, eight, nine hundred 900 students and staff worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and praising his name from all over the world. It's an amazing place to be because if you turn on the TV you click on the internet, you watch the YouTube, you can get pessimistic. It's easy. Things are going wrong in this world. While we're told the economy's getting better, most of us don't feel it. We watch our own country fall into spiritual decline, although most of us don't even recognize it. But come on up and see what God's doing for a new generation. It's amazing. I'm, I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimist. I pray for revival. My heart is that the nations would know the Lord Jesus Christ. From my own kinsmen in the flesh who are Muslim to Hindus and Buddhists and all others that they may see the unconditional love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we sometimes have missed the boat and we have set our sails to the wrong direction. We have hoped in the wrong people or in the wrong things in order to see this happen. We assume that because politics is going wrong, there can't be revival. But listen, politics can't bring revival, and politics can't stop revival. Just think of what politics is. Look at the word, poly and ticks, many blood-sucking creatures. <laughs> or at least it feels that way, doesn't it? It feels that way when you turn on TV and you think, this guy doesn't represent me. He's more caring about himself. But here's the beauty. Politics can't start revival, but politics can't stop it. What will happen in this world 
will be true when the body of Christ rises up and is counted. When we humble ourselves and become selfless, as Paul would say, to esteem others better than ourselves, we live in an incredible era. When William Carey hit India in 1793, there were about 730 million people in the world. Do you understand then there are twice as many Muslims today as when William Carey even hit India. There are more Hindus today in India than were people in the world in 1793. We live in an incredible, awesome, responsible day where we can share the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to center upon that this morning. I want to ask this question, what is it going to take to raise up a generation who will share Jesus? What characteristics must we have in order that we can see nations, peoples, Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. What must you have? What must I have? I think we look no farther than Elijah. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 18, these words, starting in verse 20. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God... Follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I'll prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood but put no fire under it. It was a dark day for Elijah. More than 2,500 years ago, Israel was collapsing. There was one public prophet left, Elijah. The, The Redeemer would come through this line, yet the entire nation was about to surrender to other gods. It was a dark day. And it was a dark day for Elijah. If you'll note the passage in a context, what happens is in 1 Kings chapter 16, the nation falls into idolatry, the worship of other gods, and in particular here, the worship of the god Baal. Baal was a god of fertility, honored during the harvest, where Baal was someone who was a god who would die and raise again from the dead, almost like a harvest of crops. And somehow Israel, after everything they've gone through, after Yahweh had answered their prayers in so many ways, decides to move off and to worship a false god. But any time, any time someone starts worshiping a false god, God will raise up a prophet. And so what you find in 1 Kings 17 is here comes Elijah. It's not a good day, it seems like, for Elijah. If you'll note verse 20, He's invited to the mountain. Now, he's invited to Mount Carmel, not for a discussion, not for a dialogue, but for his death. The point of King Ahab and his wicked wife was to snuff out the last voice of God standing in the wilderness in the gap of all the sin that was blazing through Israel. It wasn't a good day. And if you notice, it wasn't a good day for Elijah because no one would stand with him. He was the sole prophet And he was standing against 450 false prophets. But your perspective in life is everything. You see, we look at the story. If you look at it from the natural lens, we see it that there were 450 prophets versus one prophet. But that's not the way Elijah saw it. Elijah knew this was the providential hand of God. And it wasn't 450 to one. It was one to zero. One living God to a non-existent God. Your perspective is everything. Elijah should not have been optimistic. After all, when you look in verse 22, he asks a question, pleading with his nation, won't you come back to the Lord? And the eerie silence of the day was that phrase that we see that comes so true and relevant in the 21st century, but the people answered him not a word. You see, what will kill any movement of faith is not heresy, but apathy. Apathy is the bridge that leads to the death of any church, any faith, any individual. But it didn't bother him. So the question of the hour, very simply in the next few minutes, is this. 
what did Elijah have that gave him such incredible unction to reach his nation? And by the way, then later on, other nations for the Lord Jesus Christ. What characteristics were there in his heart that gave him a passion never to give up? Let's walk through just very quickly four of them. The first one is found in verses 20 to 23. It's simply this. If we're going to see this form of revival, if we're going to have a missions movement that is global and not merely individual, what we need is confrontation. Confrontation. Now listen when confrontation is. Uh, confrontation is the key to discussing with someone your faith. So here's what happens. Elijah's invited to Mount Carmel. And how does confrontation look in Scripture? Is confrontation going up to someone in some argumentative manner and slapping them over head with the Bible that you have and simply making a statement, hopefully that they would understand when it is completely foreign to them? No, that's not the way confrontation happens in Scripture. Verse 21 is an absolute key to missions, to evangelism, and to revival. The way we find ourselves into the hearts and minds of individuals, the methodology chosen by our Lord is the methodology of asking questions. An entire nation had fallen away from the Lord. In verse 21, Elijah looks to them, and what's the first thing he does? He doesn't make a statement. He asks a question. How long Will you falter between two opinions? Here's the literal question if you would read it in the Hebrew. How long will you walk crippled between two opinions? Elijah gets one shot before they're going to put him to death. And what type of question does he ask? He asks a relational question. He talks to the heart of the matter, not merely the mind of the matter. He looks to the Hebrew people and he says, You've got one foot with Baal, worshiping him. You've got one foot with Yahweh, worshiping him. Your life seems to be a disaster. Your heart is hurting. Your mind is doubting. How long will you falter between those two opinions? Then he makes a statement. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. The methodology of Elijah, the methodology of Old Testament prophets, the methodology of Jesus when he sits with the woman at the well, the methodology of Paul at the Areopagus of Acts 17 is to ask questions. That's the true biblical way of confrontation. Confrontation tries to get to the mind and the heart and the deepest part of the soul. I've been married uh, 14 years. Uh, Marrying someone cross-culturally is an enjoyable thing. Life is never boring. But here's the deal. Even when it's cross-cultural, women universally can think alike. Someone should have written uh, written a book entitled, Set Up Questions, Wives Ask Their Husbands. I promise you, it's not merely an American phenomenon. My wife somehow got this book in the Czech Republic in Czech of set up. And they're not, guys, they're not hard questions. You know them. They're easy questions. But women don't ask these questions at 3 p.m. in the afternoon when our minds are sharp. No, they wait till about midnight when your mind is weak and your heart is soft. And they'll ask a simple question. Here's what my wife asked one evening. Honey, was I the only one for you? Now, gentlemen, pretty simple. If you're single in here, answer, yes, move on. You're done. Don't discuss it. Don't go into detail. Yes, you're the only one for me. Unless you're an idiot, that's the answer. (laughs) Idiot. See, when I was at Southeastern Seminary, I was teaching philosophy. Every day for eight hours, I would teach Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and Leotard and all. That was my mind. That's where I was trained as in philosophy. So while my wife was simply asking an emotional question, one she wanted to hear from her newlywed husband, was I the only one for you? My mind was philosophical. Here's what I heard in my head. Honey, I'd like to discuss predestination, free will, and how that amounts in our life. (laughs) Because I'm an idiot. So I romantically looked in her eye and I said, no. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Thanks for not writing the book. You ever see that face from your wife? You know you're in trouble, desperate trouble. So I backed up. I did the best I could. I said, honey, look, out of all the men in biblical parameters that God set you in, 
that you could have dated and married, you chose me. And out of all the women I could have chosen, now that was a theoretical question. I was a geek growing up, never had a date. I was a nerd, so look, that was just pure theory. But nonetheless, all the women I could have dated and married, God put us together and we chose each other. And honey, would you rather I loved you because I had to or would you rather I loved you because I wanted to? That was the right answer. I knew it was the right answer. I saw her face, and uh, our daughter was born about nine months later. (laughs) What's the point of evangelism? The point of evangelism is never to win an argument, is it? The point of evangelism is to get to someone's mind, is to get to their heart, to get to the deepest fiber of their being, where you know because you know from your own feelings and effects and consequences that the sins of life. Do you know what, what Elijah did here? He didn't confront them to push them back. He confronted them to pull them in. There's a massive difference in biblical confrontation and being obnoxious. So Elijah begins a conversation, yet the people of Israel won't listen. So what chance do we have if Elijah can't get a hearing? Well, it's not over yet. See, verses 20 to 23 talk about confrontation, but then the second characteristic you and I need is not merely confrontation, it's confidence. Now, listen to the difference. I didn't say cockiness. Confidence. Here's the difference. Confidence says, look at Jesus, while cockiness says, look at me. Confidence is based in humility, but you boldly walk into the throne of God knowing what you and I celebrate, the three greatest words ever spoken. We celebrate every Easter and should every Sunday. He is risen. And for you and I not to be confident in the gospel is a mockery to Jesus' sinless life, the sacrificial death, and the certainty of his resurrection. The world doesn't need a maybe. The world needs the Savior. And that's what happens. You know, Elijah's confident, but the confidence may seem a little bit um, arrogant. If you want to walk with Elijah and his confidence, here's what happens. Look at verse 26 and 27. This is Elijah's confidence. So they took the bull, which was given to them. This is Baal, the prophets of Baal. They prepared it. They called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. So The prophets of Baal have an idolatrous worship service of a false god for three straight hours from 9 a.m. till noon. Here's what they say. Oh, Baal, hear us. Do you want to hear what should break your heart? What hurts me every time I read this from my own kinsmen in the flesh? Most of my family is still Muslim. But there was no voice. No one answered. Drop down to verse 29, and as if it wasn't enough to echo into the chambers of your heart, he says it again. But there was no voice. No one answered. And then he adds this heartbreaking consequence. No one paid attention. Today, you and I wake up, and we get to worship the one true living God, and it is the honor of the universe. You get to come in here, and the glory of God's word from the promise of his gospel is that when you open it, he speaks. I will never take for granted when God speaks. I had grown up worshiping Allah, a false God, and I still remember looking up and saying, I speak to you. Why don't you speak to me? I would learn later on, dead gods don't speak. And today, across the world, whether false monotheists worshiping one false god or false polytheists worshiping many false gods, people wake up in darkness. And the worst form of darkness is silence. When we get to hear the sweet voice of God, there must be confidence. Now, it is, it, this confidence gets crazy. Look at verse 27, and you're going to have to explain this. Verse 27, so it was at noon that Elijah, here's the word, mock them. You can't replace that. You can't change that. He made fun of them. That's not something I've ever been taught to do, have you? You ever taken an evangelism seminar, which the first thing they ever taught is, hey, number one, make fun of them. I haven't. So what is he doing? We'll see it here in a second. He doesn't just mock them. Verse 27 says, he says, mock them and said, cry aloud. 
For he's a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey and perhaps needs to be awakened. You can literally translate that first phrase, maybe he's meditating. Hey, maybe your God's sitting on a toilet. Why? You, you can't excuse it, so you have to explain it. Why? Why would he say such a thing? I want you to mark this down. The deeper someone is in their sin, the stronger your words may have to be to get them out of that sin. For we who have children, you know this. Sometimes you speak to your children in a way you don't want to speak to them that way. But they're walking the path of destruction. And if you aren't stronger in your words, they're going to fall off that sinful cliff. Do you know why he said all those things, by the way, in verse 27? Here's the irony. The prophets of Baal promised all of those things were true. The prophets of Baal actually said, you know, sometimes Baal doesn't answer because he's sitting meditating. Sometimes he's on vacation. And sometimes he's sleeping. Now, here's a question. Why would the prophets of Baal say that? You have to make an excuse for a God that doesn't speak. Verse 27 is a demonstration of the excuses given that Elijah says, aren't you tired of the excuses? Aren't you tired of the burdens? You know, that's what Jesus understands so well that we didn't. What has he said to all of us, regardless of the faith from which we came, the traditions where we were raised? Come unto me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, burdened, born down by sin, and I will give you, the Greek word we use in English is rest, literally means I'll refresh your soul. Aren't you tired? If you're a Muslim, aren't you tired of trying to follow the pillars of Islam, working your way to heaven when you know there's no promise? If you're Hindu, aren't you tired of thinking you're going to be reincarnated? One Hindu scholar says as many as seven million times before finally you can be purified out. Aren't you tired? Jesus answers. It takes confrontation and it takes confidence, but don't miss this. It takes compassion. Confrontation without compassion is arrogance. Compassion without confrontation, though, is mere emotionalism. I love the compassion of Elijah. He gets their attention, verse 27. The people who would not answer him a word finally changed their hearts. Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. Do you see the intimacy? All the people came near to him. And then what's the first thing he does? He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Let me see if I get this right. Number one, Elijah spoke very intimately. He said, all right, guys, you got, you got what I said? Why don't you just circle around me? Very intimate. But then he does something odd. He gets their ear. The nation's about to be saved. And he said, okay, guys, it's time to remodel the church. Does it make any sense? Why would the first thing he do is say, I wonder what the paint on the wall should be? But it's not that, is it? What is he really doing is he's solving the identity crisis that all human beings have. Identity of who are we and what's our purpose? The Israelites even asked that. Notice why he repaired the altar in verse 31. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So why, why was he repairing the altar? The altar was representative that to remind the people, God loves you, and he has an identity for you. That's compassion. Compassion means you and I will go out of our way to share Jesus with those who are not even knowing they need to hear it. Let me put it this way. Let me ask you this question. Where do you think is an inappropriate place to share the gospel? Where would you think is an inappropriate place to share the gospel? I'd submit to you that's probably the most important place you'd share the gospel is the place that you think, well, that's not polite. It's not the right time. It's not the right place. For example, I'll, I'll put it another way. Where in our own evangelical churches today will more lost people come than any other event most or if all churches have? Here's a hint. It's not Mother's Day. And it's not Easter. It's a funeral. 
more lost people will don the doors of this church or most other churches during a funeral than any other one singular event. But I'd submit to you that may be in evangelical circles where we're least likely to hear the gospel. I pastored before I got into Christian education and higher education and pastored church out in North Carolina and I finished pastoring. I found out one of the ladies that was near and dear to me, she was one of sort of uh, the encouragers of the church. She had passed on and gone on to be with the Lord and I went back. I didn't officiate the funeral. I simply was there to honor her memory. So I'm sitting way in the back. I mean, way back here to the left. And I watched two preachers come up, and they do a great job, great job honoring her, memorializing her. But they never once shared the gospel. And it broke me. That church sat about 200. And I literally sat way in the back because the church was packed. And there were more lost people there than saved people. I literally sat in the back and went, hey, there's so-and-so. I knocked on their door and they slammed it in my face, but they're here today. There's that whole family. You know, I baptized their daughter, but I couldn't get to the whole family. But they're here today. And then I went through the whole service and not, not once was the gospel shared. I'm driving home. My wife is with me. We're newlyweds again. And she looks at me, she goes, man, you're angry. I said, yeah, I wear my emotions on the sleeve. She said, well, what can you do? I said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to promise you this. I'm going to promise when I die, the gospel will be preached. And I was in my 30s, and she goes, well, you're in your 30s. You don't know when you're going to die, and you don't know who's going to preach your funeral. I said, I know both of those. I can answer both of those right now. She said, how? I said, well, anybody who knows me knows my dietary habits. I'm not an omnivore, I'm a carnivore. Vegetable is not a food. Vegetable is what food eats. I'm a carnivore. And look, I know, I know one day, the last words I'm going to hear before I see Jesus will be clear, and then I'll be with him. <laughs> and I know who's going to preach my funeral. My wife said, well, who's going to preach your funeral? Here's a beauty. We live in an incredible age of technology. So I told her, I said, I am. Now, I want you to think about it. I pray it gives you an idea to do the same. Live in an A in technology, right? You can be on a screen anytime. So one day, I'm going to be on a screen like this. I'm going to be smiling. And I'm going to say, hello, I'm with Jesus. And you're not yet. <laughs> Don't mourn over me. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach long. And I'm going to preach hard. You can't get mad at me, right? I'm the guy in the box. I mean, the shell's there, the nut's gone, but you can't get mad at me. I'm going to preach long. I'm going to preach hard. I'm going to give an invitation. Maybe you can come forward and shake the preacher's hand if you want to get saved. may sound a bit crazy, but just imagine it. One day, you go on to be with the Lord. Your loved ones file in. They're on their edge of their seat and on the edge of eternity thinking about who you are and hopefully who you are in Christ. And one last time you get to give your testimony. One last time you get to your family. One last time you get to get to your friends. And one last time you can share, not of yourself, not of your own memories, but of the grace and love of the Lord Jesus Christ that snatched you from death to life, from bondage to freedom. That's compassion. There is not an inappropriate place to share the gospel. But I remind you, one last characteristic Elijah had, it's going to be costly. It's an amazing thing because few times in scripture do you get to see revival. But this passage gives revival. What does revival look like for an idolatrous people? Well, if you look at verses 37 and following, just look at verse 37. Here is Elijah's compassion who he says, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. There's the beginning of revival. How does revival flesh out? Verse 39, now when all the people saw it, they literally fell on their noses forward. And they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now, let me see if I can get this right. 
About 30 seconds previous to that, they were worshiping a false god. Yeah. And God accepts their worship? Yeah. That's our God. There is not one too dirty, too sinful, or too wayward. That the Lord's not saying, come unto me, and I will give you rest. You mean you could be worshiping a false God and bowing to him and turn and come to him and he'll accept it? Yes. You know why I know that? It happened with me. I went from bowing to a false God, getting up, going to a revival, and God said, yeah, come. You hear my voice? Do you hear for the first time God speaking? That's me, and I love you, and I died for you. But it's going to be costly. It's going to cost us something. What did it cost the nation of Israel? Verse 40. Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Here's the eerie part of the end of the story. The prophets of Baal walked into Israel knowing the laws of Israel, according to Deuteronomy 13 and other passages, meant that if they were ever proven a false prophet, they would be put to death, and they were fine with that. Do you see the irony? How ironic is it that people today are willing to die for a faith that is false, and most Christians aren't willing to die for a faith that is real? The stark idea of Elijah is that the faith that's worth living for is a faith that's worth dying for. And the faith that's worth dying for, that's the faith that's worth living for. I grew up under Islam, but my wife, well, she grew up under communism. She grew up under the oppression because her father was a pastor, her grandfather was a pastor, her brother is now a pastor. But few are Christian in the Czech Republic. 60% of that nation of 10 million are atheists. They don't even believe in a God, and that was the culmination of communism. My wife can tell you story after story of what happened to her because she chose Christ, not communism. My political hero is Ronald Reagan. Grew up under the 80s of Ronald Reagan. I still remember him standing at the Brandenburg Gate and looking into the camera and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What I did know at the time was, behind that wall was my wife. Then when the wall fell and freedom came, the Czechs call it the Velvet Revolution. Not a shot was fired. Freedom came peacefully. The story started to come out of Christians who were persecuted. Many times they were so much milder than they were in the former Soviet Union of Russia and Romania and others, but they were real. They were tangible. Got to hear of the story of one pastor who his heart was to get the Czech Bible into every person's hands in their language, in Czech, but you couldn't mass produce it. Czech Bible was not allowed to be published in mass production in the home country. So he decided to smuggle in Bibles. He was uh, able, because East Germany was under communism, to drive over to East Germany where they had a secret warehouse where they'd publish Czech Bibles. And the way he'd do it is he'd take that little car, he'd drive by night, he'd take his little girl with him, he'd get to the place where they would get the bushels of Bibles, they would had a secret compartment underneath the back seat of his car, he'd stick the Bibles in there, close that back seat, and he'd lay his little girl down on the back seat. The reason he took her with him was when he would be stopped by the KGB, the KGB would rummage through the car, they would interrogate him, do all sorts of awful things, but they'd never find the Bibles because she was sleeping on them. And they'd never bother the little girl. And he would do this back and forth and back and forth simply to get the Bible into the hands of the people that were atheists and would deny Christ. I know that story. I didn't hear it in the Czech Republic. I heard it here in the States. I heard it because the man who did it is now my father-in-law. And the little girl sleeping on the Bibles, well, that's my wife. And as I'm listening to the story, it dawned on me, why are we not reaching Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and others for the Lord Jesus Christ? 
is we've got to raise up a generation. We've got to invest in them, and we've got to call them that they're to go and we're to go. It's an easier thing to say, I'll go, but isn't it mom and dad and grandma and grandpa a little bit more difficult to say, Lord, take my daughter, take my son, take my grandchild. But I am convinced the way we're going to see this world one to Christ is not merely the sacrifice individually, but as families. It is our call to raise up our children with what Deuteronomy 6 says, to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But here's the final question then. At the end of the day, if your grandson or granddaughter, if your child comes home to you and says, hey, mom and dad, I want to let you know something that happened in church today. Sure, what is it? My, I think I'm called to go overseas. I don't know how that's going to work out, but God said I need to go. And God's putting a certain nation on my heart, and it's not a wealthy nation. It's an impoverished nation. It's not a free nation. It's a hurting nation. It's a persecuting nation. What's your response going to be? You, you have two choices. You can either be a Barnabas and encourage them, or you can be a Barabbas and steal from them. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it is the most biblical thing to do. It's the reason why in my family, my son has already been twice to Thailand. My son's already visited Hindu temples at the age of eight and nine and Buddhist temples and mosques, not so they can affirm what is held there, but they should get a heart to share Jesus there. What is your faith worth to you? I promise you, the joy you find in faith will come when you understand, when I understand, a faith worth living for is a faith that's worth dying for. Let's pray together. Lord, work in our hearts. It is the promise of Isaiah, your word never returns void. Is a promise of our Lord Jesus Christ that will refresh our spirit. It is a promise of the Holy Spirit who will convict us of what is next in our life. Lord, we dream of the day where people from each nation will worship you, every tribe and tongue. Lord, we know these things to be true, that you love the world, and you gave yourself for her. May we share, have the boldness of Elijah and his compassion. In Christ's name we pray, amen.